Blake Chappelle was a typical teenager living in Coweta County, Georgia. He liked to skateboard and ride dirt bikes. He laughed at stupid pranks and jackass and listened to metal. On October 16th of 2011, Blake took his girlfriend, Ryan, to the homecoming dance. It would be the happiest and last night of his life. From Crawl Space Media, I'm Jennifer Mel. We're breaking a little bit with our usual format to bring you the story of Blake Chappelle's mysterious and untimely death. This is the first of two parts. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. I'm Blake's mother. Blake was a wonderful kid. Had a lot of friends. Great smile. You know, it's usually those, seems to be those people that have so much to offer. Sometimes that are, their lives cut short you know, for no good reason. Melissa shared with me a piece of paper scrawled over in Blake's messy teenage boy handwriting. At the top, it spelled bucket list in bubble letters and listed over a hundred goals for his life. I want to share with you a few items on this list because it really tells us how dedicated Blake was to bettering himself and how excited he was for the rest of his life. Tell someone how I feel about them. Go to Florida for spring break. Take responsibility for your actions. Don't get angry so easily. Let something go. Get closer to your brother. Buy a pack of cigarettes legally. Stay at least one night in a mansion. Don't give up on yourself. Go back to school and graduate. Move into your own place. Get a job and buy your own car. Find a good girl and stay faithful. Take a road trip. Get your license. Help out mom more. Have a son or a daughter. Don't give up on yourself. He's from a young age, you know, he loved video games. Uh, Him and his older brother uh, and he was really really good at Guitar Hero when it first came out you know I bought him all the the drum sets and the guitars and all the things that would hook up to through the game and they spent a lot of time playing you know um, Guitar Hero he loved to uh, ride a skateboard uh, he was really into that. He loved being outside, period. He loved fishing. Um, we had a pond on our property that the last place that we moved to. It was a 70-acre piece of land. And when I found this particular property, I knew that it was going to be perfect for him because he also had two dirt bikes that he loved to ride. So he would spend, he spent that last summer riding his dirt bikes and fishing in the pond and Started school at East Coweta High in Coweta County that fall and met his girlfriend then. He was just so happy, so, so happy, you know, at that point in his life. He, uh, I don't know why, I'm, I apologize. I'm getting, getting very anxious for some reason. I don't know why. I got to calm down here. I try to just kind of put it on autopilot lately and, I apologize. The pain in Melissa's voice is clear. It's hard to tell that ten years have passed since her son's death. Her grief is still as if it happened yesterday. But I want to start by letting Melissa tell you about the year before Blake's disappearance. I think it's important to understand Blake's situation and where he was coming from. We're not sure if this event has anything to do with Blake's eventual disappearance or his death. 
but it could. There's a reason Blake and his mother moved to their wooded property in Coweta, Georgia. A year previous, Blake and Melissa lived between the towns of Jonesboro and Lovejoy in Clayton County. They lived in a large mobile home park called Hunter Ridge. There, Blake was dating a girl called Skylar. Their relationship seemed like a typical angsty teenage affair. Skylar unfortunately had a difficult living situation. She lived with her mother Brandy and stepfather Earl. Earl was described as a controlling man, and it seems like both of his daughter and his wife lived in either fear or deference to him. Skylar dreamed of escape, and she would often dream with Blake about how they could leave and make a life for themselves somewhere outside Clayton County, Georgia. He was dating this girl, and during that whole time, the mother and the father were having problems, I guess, with the, with the girl. And when she started dating Blake, the mother, I uh, overheard the mother telling Blake uh, that, you know, any time that she got into trouble, that it was going to be blamed on him when she told the dad, the stepfather, actually, you know, and that it was his responsibility to keep her out of trouble. And she actually, uh, there was an incident where the girl, I guess, left school and came over to our house. Blake was sick that day. So she came over to the house and she told me that her mother had given her permission to leave school to go home because she was having problems. Uh, she felt ill. So anyway, she comes over. She's there for a couple hours. She's, you know, around the time that school lets out. She asked me to give her a ride home, and I said, sure. So I, I, you know, gave her a ride home. She lived maybe two miles from us. I turned into her neighborhood, and she asked me to stop and let her out. And I never do that. I always take her all the way home. So I knew right then that, you know, something was up with that. And so I, I just dropped her off and told her to be careful and go straight home. And we went home, and about an hour later... Well, about 30 minutes later, her mom shows up with her, and I met her in the garage with Blake, and the, apparently the mother didn't know that she had left school and that she was at my house all day long. So he was very, very upset. Um, then she, she just, out of the blue, backhands the girlfriend in the face. Uh, I just, it, it startled me so badly because the house that we lived in was on a very tall hill. Our driveway was like almost straight down and she knocked her off her feet. And I literally thought that she was going to roll all the way down our driveway. But then she, you know, proceeded to tell Blake that, you know, that when she gets home and tells her, his girlfriend's stepfather, that, you know, he's going to he's going to take care of him. And I just immediately stopped her. And I said, look, you know, I don't know what you've got going on in your family or with your children, you know, but your responsibility is your children and he's mine. And nobody's going to put their hands on my child for any reason whatsoever. She explained, you know, uh, the mother says that she's been, you know, keeping a lot of things from the stepfather at this point, lying to him because the little girl had been getting in, you know, in trouble for various things. And that the only reason that Blake hadn't been taken care of before then was because she had kept those things from him. But after that conversation, uh, well, you know, she, during the last part of the conversation, she told Blake, she says, well, you know, give her a hug because you guys are no more, you know, you're not, you're not allowed to date anymore. And at that point I was relieved because I had already had conversations with Blake before about the type of girl she was not saying she's any different than any other teenage girl. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't, you know, I just could see some little things that I didn't think were healthy. And as we all know, when we're dealing with teenagers, if you try to force your teenager to do something or tell them not to do something, they usually 
end up doing the opposite of what you want them to do just out of rebellion. I mean, that's just the nature of a teenager. And so I, I didn't, I never pushed it really hard because I knew that if I did, that he would probably, you know, take that opportunity to rebel a little bit. Clearly, Skylar was in a difficult family situation, and of course, Blake wanted to help her. A few weeks later, Blake and a friend got in trouble for sneaking out. Melissa also discovered that a piece of her jewelry was missing. She confronted Blake about this, and they got into an argument. In order to teach Blake a lesson, Melissa asked that he leave the house. So Blake went to stay with a friend. On May 28, 2011, the third day after Blake had been gone, Melissa got a call from Skylar, asking if Blake was there. I told her no. Um, I knew they were broken up. I knew that they that she was bad news. Uh, you know, I didn't want her around Blake, and she was she was upset and crying. I told her, I said, you know, don't you know what's going on, Skylar? Me and my mom got into a fight, and I'm just so sick of everything. And I said, well, just calm down. You know, I just talked with her for a few minutes, and. And uh, she hung up, and I guess about 30 minutes had passed. I'd actually told her, because she kept pressing me about where he was, and I told her that she was at a different friend's in the, the same neighborhood. Because I, did, I, I didn't want her, you know, around Blake. I, I knew deep down inside, I had this gut feeling that she was, there was going to be some trouble. About 30 minutes after Skylar's call, I get, a, I get a call from Brandy, her mother. She said, do you know where Skylar is? And I said, no. She said, uh, I said, she called me about 30 minutes ago and asked if Blake was here. And, you know, I told her no. And um, she goes, well, I just got home from the store and her and I had gotten into an argument earlier. And she had taken, I guess, some red lipstick and wrote across the TV screen in the living room, I hate you, bitch, and left this little note that basically says what most teenagers say to their parents when they're upset and run away. So she leaves, and her house is about two miles from Hunter Ridge, um, and we're kind of like in a triangle from where we live to where she lives to Hunter Ridge. The mother says, well, she's not here. Where's Blake? And I told, I told her exactly where Blake was. I said, Blake's not with her. Apparently, Blake had left, got on his bike, went looking for Skylar in the neighborhood. Because if anybody would have known where she was, he would have. This is where the events of that afternoon become a little confusing. Based on the phone call from Skylar to Melissa, we know that she and Blake had not yet connected. The police report for this incident tells the story a little differently. From the police statement, it seems Blake did find Skylar that afternoon, and they were hiding out together in a wooded area in Hunter Ridge, trying to avoid being found by Skylar's parents. This will become an important distinction, because the police will later use this against Blake in criminal charges. Melissa tells a slightly different version of events, and we're not sure what exactly transpired. Well, at some sometime at this point, Brandy, the mother, had already called the stepfather. About this time, the friend that he went to, that he had been staying with for two days, calls me, and I'm at home. I have no cell phone either. I just have a home phone with call waiting. The friend calls me and says, Blake went to look for Skylar on his bike and Earl is going through the neighborhood with two other guys showing kids a gun and telling them if they see Blake to tell them he's got something for him. And I start to panic. Well, at the point that I guess Josh had been calling me on, was calling me on the phone my caller, my call waiting kicks in and it's Brandy and she's laughing. She's saying, um, well, I called Earl and I told him, you know, what Skylar did. Uh, and 
uh, he's, he's out here now looking for Blake. And I just lost it. I told her, I said, if he puts a hand on my son, I promise you he will go to jail. And she thinks, she thinks it's funny. She's just laughing. And I've already been told by Josh on the other line that he's showing a gun to other people looking for my son. So this goes on back and forth, back and forth. She hangs up. She calls me from Skylar's phone. She hangs up. She calls me from her phone. She hangs up, uh, you know, and it's, and it's the kid calling me, me back. Um, he's screaming, Earl spotted Blake and he's got Skylar on the back on the, on his bike. Blake had pegs on his bike. So she's, she's standing on the pegs on the back wheel and he's, you know, riding the bike, taking her across a, a soccer field to one of his other friend's house. And she lives, the back of her house faces the soccer field. And at some point, he was seen by Earl and the, the, the two guys that he had brought. And they chased him down, knocked him off his bike, beat him pretty badly, pretty badly. They grabbed Skylar and threw her in the trunk of the car and left. Blake's friend who was with him that day called 911. The responding officer goes to meet Blake and calls Melissa back. He explains to me what had happened and tells me that, you know, he has Blake there with him and asks and then put Blake's, put, put Blake on the phone. Blake's, you know, he's telling me, I'm okay, Mom, I'm okay. Um, but I could tell that he wasn't. I was really upset, and I told him, I said, honey, um, we're, um, we're going to come pick you up. Once Blake is back at his mother's, Melissa took stock of what damage had been done to her son. I could tell he had really been through something kind of, you know, traumatic. And um, he, was, he was crying. He was upset. I was crying. I was upset. I'm trying to clean the blood off of him everywhere. Um. You know, I don't know if his nose was broken or not, but the ambulance had, had responded and they checked him out. And the officer told me that they said that he was OK. Well, when Blake got got home, he explained to me that they checked him out. And, I, you know, and I was questioning him. Well, what did they say? You know, well, they said I had a pretty bad concussion. But and I said, what? You know, and, and he's like, yeah, mom, but I didn't want to go to the hospital because I didn't want to ha- for you to have a bill that you had to pay that you weren't responsible for. <laughs> it just broke my heart. <laughs> we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. According to the police report, the story Clayton County received was wildly different than what Blake and his friends told Melissa. Despite having a statement from Blake himself, and a statement from his friend corroborating Blake's version of the events, the police seemed to side with Earl's account of that day. Earl told them that Skylar left a message saying she was running off with Blake to Tennessee, so he went out looking for the pair. Earl denied both having a gun or showing a gun to kids in the neighborhood. He explained that he was a convicted felon and that even possessing a firearm could land him back in jail. He also denied attacking Blake. He said he grabbed Skylar and put her in the back seat of his car, not the trunk. Later, when interviewed by police, Skylar backed up her stepfather's story, though it's hard to imagine a vulnerable young girl who was possibly being abused by her stepfather saying anything that might get him in trouble with the law. According to Melissa, there were a couple of incidents of Earl trying to steer the narrative. So the next day I get a call from from the friend, Josh, telling me that Earl is back in the neighborhood going up to all these kids 
and threatening them that if they, if any of them say anything about what happened, that he, he was coming, uh, you know, that there were going to be repercussions of some sort. I don't know the exact words he used. I wasn't there, but so Sunday morning, I receive a call and on my caller ID, which pops up on my TV screen, um, through, because we have phone and internet and everything through our cable company. So the caller ID gives you an, uh, you know, the ID of the person calling on the TV screen. And it said, Clayton County Sheriff's Department. So I answer the phone. The guy on the other end explains that he's the officer that's been assigned to the case. And I'm like, well, I was just told yesterday that it wouldn't be assigned till Tuesday. He goes, well, I went ahead and picked it up. Um, so he starts asking me all these questions. And then he talks to Blake for the longest time. He asked if he could speak to Blake. And, I, you know, I'm not stupid. You know, I, I, I make sure that I keep my children at any point. I mean, I've never really had any interaction with police officers with either of my children. So um, Blake hands me back the phone and I speak with him a little bit more. And I said, oh, and by the way, before you go, um, apparently this Earl Jones has returned to Hunter Ridge and was approaching, you know, all these kids that saw what happened and, you know, threatening them that if they said anything, he goes and the guy on the phone goes, now, why would he do that? And I said, you know, I really don't know. Why don't you tell me? And at that point, I felt really uneasy. Why this officer would say something like that to me, first and foremost. uh, I called my sister and and we're, we're, we're talking and talking and talking. She goes, you know what? So she said, look, look at the number that called you. She said, you know, because who was it? And I told her, I said, it it said it was Jones, Jonesboro or Clayton County Sheriff's Department on the caller ID. So I, when I pulled it up, it actually had Earl Jones's phone number. He spoofed me. I, had no, I didn't even know what spoofing was. He spoofed me and pretended to be the investigating officer. And it was him that I had been speaking to. And that spoke to Blake. So he obviously changed his voice or something. I was not familiar with Earl's voice. But I don't know if maybe he spoke differently to him than he did me, you know, to disguise his voice. I don't know. But Blake Blake had no clue. So two weeks goes by. And it said Jonesboro Police Department. The guy on the other end says, Hello, my name is, and he says, I'm the investigator assigned to the to Blake's case. He says, sorry, it took me so long. Uh, they assigned me the case, the case on Tuesday. So I explained everything that had happened and that I was pressing charges. So I called the police department. I verified the guy's name and his position. Um, now, at that point, when I spoke to him, because I didn't know if this was really the officer or not, from the previous prank, uh, I didn't tell him that Earl Jones had called me pretending to be him at that point because I wanted to make sure that this guy was actually an officer. He calls me up. He says, you know, Miss Becker, um, did you bring Blake down? Uh, I've got a couple more questions I want to ask him. Um, so we can get this case, you know, moving. And, or actually, I think he said to get, to get this case closed, thinking to myself, why did he use the word closed when I, I'm pressing charges? Why would you be closing a case? I, I don't know. Like I said, I didn't have that much experience with police officers at that point or the lingo or, you know, um, the way things work when you go to court or, you know, or you're arrested or anything like that. So, um, 
I take Blake down to the sheriff's department. He said, meet me at the sheriff's department. So we, we got there about 30 minutes early. I picked Blake up from school. He comes in the front door, first time I'd ever seen him, comes over, introduced himself, shakes my hand, shakes Blake's hand, says, uh, hey, so you, uh, you ready to go upstairs? And Blake and I had already discussed, you know, um, that I was going to go with him, you know, for the questioning, if he, you know, whatever questions, because I had some things that I needed to tell him. Blake says, yep. And he stood up and I stood up and he goes, uh, no, only he's the only one that's going to go. And I said, no, I said, I'm going to go with him. No, he said, Blake said, no, my mom's going to come with us. And he said, no, uh, he goes, how old are you? And Blake says, 17. He goes, no, you're, you're old enough to go up by yourself. And I looked at him, I said, well, he wants me to come with him and I want to, you know, go with him. He goes, no, um, Matter of fact, and he walks over to the desk and he says, now, come on. He says, you're old enough to go up there by yourself. Let's just get this taken care of. So Blake goes upstairs and he's gone for like three and a half hours. Instead of pressing charges on Earl, they decided to charge Blake as an adult with one count of interference with custody. According to the warrant application affidavit, interference with custody is a person who knowingly or recklessly takes or entices any child away from the individual who has lawful custody of such child, or knowingly harbors any child who has absconded. The warrant reads, quote, Accused assisted Skylar with absconding from her parents when he met her in the woods at Hunter Ridge Mobile Home Park after she left a note at her home saying she was running away. When he was asked if he knew the whereabouts of Skylar, he told her mother that he didn't know, even though he knew she was in the woods. Accused admitted to knowing that Skylar had run away, end quote. According to the story police believed, Blake was a criminal adult who was trying to abscond with Earl's stepdaughter. And I lost it. I, my knees just buckled. Because <laughs> my child has just been beaten. He's been threatened. <laughs> We've been spoofed. Then we, you tell me to bring him down for questioning about his own case. And you're telling me you're arresting him. He goes, yep, yes, ma'am. Blake was arrested and spent 17 days in jail. During his time in custody, a lawyer came to visit Blake, and she assured him that she was just there to get his side of the story. At the time, Blake thought this woman was his defense lawyer, but she actually worked for the prosecution. It was either not made apparent to him or he didn't quite understand, but Blake essentially incriminated himself to the prosecution. Melissa was livid. What followed was an extremely emotional time for Blake and his mom. I, I went and visited him every day that I could, um, that they allowed me to. They released Blake. And that was right when it was getting dark, uh, about seven. And I, at that point, I just lost it because they had done everything they could to take away my rights and my voice from my child. He was not an adult. He was a child. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Blake was released into his mother's custody on a signature bond. Melissa says that in the following weeks, she and her son were harassed by Earl. It was at this time that Melissa decided that they needed to get out of Clayton County and make a fresh start somewhere else. You know, I thought, I've just, I've got to, I, we've got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. 
this uh, Brandy Jones was driving past our house. She was parking across the street from our house where I could see her from my bedroom window. But I had just suddenly made up my mind that we, we had to get out of there. So I started looking and I found this 70 acre place in Coweta County in Sonoya and um, met with the guy. It was really a horrible little cabin like thing, but the property was absolutely beautiful and I was desperate. And so I took it. You have Coweta County. Then you have Fayette County, and then you have on the other side of Fayette, Clayton County, which is, I don't know, about a 30, 40 minute drive from where we were living to where we moved to. Uh, I knew that it would it was probably going to be Blake's favorite place in the world because it had the pond and it had plenty of room for him to ride his dirt bikes. That was going to be a great way for us to reconnect. You know, I think in his mind, he really thought of it as getting away from just bad news. He was, he was loyal to his friends, but some of them weren't, you know, some of these kids got in trouble a lot, you know, and he was just friends with everyone. You know, I mean, it didn't matter what your race, what your sex, what your, you know, how much money your parents made or, you know, it didn't matter to him. And he always wanted to help someone, you know, he would bring home straight animals because he knew I was an animal lover. You know, he didn't necessarily like animals that much because, you know, it was his chore to help me clean up after him. So, um, but he knew I loved them. So he, he would bring them home anyway. You know, and he'd bring home what I called stray kids. You know, they got locked out of their house or their parents aren't home. They're gone for a week or a weekend and they, they're hungry or, you know, whatever. He would bring these kids home and we would give them a place to sleep and something to eat. And, you know, and he always wanted to make somebody else comfortable. Blake settled into his new home in Sonoya. And in that fall of 2011 he started attending East Coweta High School. Being a pretty outgoing kid, he quickly made friends. Among them was a boy named Austin. And Blake also met a girl called Ryan and fell in love for the first time. His new girlfriend, super sweet. They got along great. Um, He was like totally head over heels for this girl. And so they started dating. Um, Her mom would bring her over. I cooked dinner, um, I guess he'd been in school for about a month, and I asked him, I told him, I said, well, tell all your friends at school that, you know, I want to have a cookout, and we're going to have, you know, steak and potatoes and salad or whatever, and make sure, you know, everybody can eat steak, and invite them over for dinner. So he did, and so we could get a chance to meet his friends, and, you know, they could meet me and I could meet them and and we had a great time and that was the first time I met his girlfriend and that was the first time that I met Austin. So it was it was a great night, you know, all of his friends showed up. The boys camped out with him in the front yard in tents. Um I guess they weren't quite brave enough to go the mile back down the hill to sleep next to the creek or the, the pond. Um, but they did sleep out in tents in the front yard and I felt okay with that at that point because I just felt like the, the past had started to die off, you know, um, we still had this thing hanging over his, you know, his head with going to court, but I knew that no judge in his right mind is going to see the facts of this case. And this not be thrown out. I felt like, you know, he was okay. I mean, he was not, he was not allowed to go anywhere, not even outside the house without me during the summertime when we, when we moved there. He, he, he didn't go anywhere. He never left the house without me. And I don't think he left the house, but maybe just a handful of times with me. 
And um, so when when he had the camp over, I thought, okay, there's there's kids with him. You know, it's everything. He's just 10, 20 feet out the door or whatever, and he'll be okay. Um, I, I couldn't keep a stranglehold on him, you know. Even though he knew that, you know, what was going on was serious, he was still a teenager. He still had to ha- have a life. You know, I mean, he did ride his motorcycle during the summer. Of course, I wasn't on the back of it. Um, but that's the only time, really, that he ever got out of my vision, my sight. On October 14th, Blake went back to Clayton County for his court date. Thankfully, the judge read the situation exactly how Melissa thought they might. They threw out the case against Blake. As far as Clayton County was concerned, they wanted to sweep the whole incident between Blake and Skyler and Earl under the rug. So we left the courthouse. Blake's telling everybody, you know, on, on his social media that he's going to homecoming dance that next day. And Blake had also made a comment on so, on his social media. He had made a derogatory comment uh, about Earl saying that Earl hits like a little bitch, which, you know, I mean, obviously I understand that it probably embarrassed him in front of his friends, you know, to be attacked like that. But then, you know, I mean, you not only that, you know, you, he was, it was his way of, I don't know, I guess trying to get a hit back. So that this was his only outlet to make, you know, some derogatory or to get some type of hit in, I guess. I got very mad, you know, upset with him about him making, I didn't want him to make things worse for himself. Blake posted this comment just a day before the homecoming dance, which was the night Blake disappeared. Melissa worried that Earl might have seen it. So she remembers sitting down next to Blake and saying something that would come to haunt her. And I grabbed his leg and I told him, I said, and I don't even know why I said this, but I told him, I said, I can't live without you. I said, you need to quit doing this stupid shit. You know, I, I didn't do it. I, I know, honey, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about, you know, the little things that make us argue. I said, you're a good kid. I said, but just, you're going to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. and Something's going to happen. And I just... I just wanted to put my arms around him and protect him from everything. But it's it's like the harder I tried, the worse things got. If you have any information on the death of Blake Chappelle, please contact the Noonan Police at 770-254-2350. Or you can contact Private Investigations for the Missing directly at piftmtips at gmail.com or on their toll-free line at 1-866-331-6660. Remember, you can remain anonymous. Missing is a Crawl Space Media production. This episode was produced and edited by myself, Jennifer Amell, with research by Private Investigations for the Missing Volunteer, Kathleen Studer. <laughs>